Today in the show we have BlackRock launching a regulated tokenized fund using Securitize, Standard Charter leveraging stablecoins for cross-border payments, Alipay using Avalanche blockchain for their loyalty program, and so much more. I'm your host Maurício Magaldi and this is Block Drops, your weekly digest on blockchain for business. These news are not a form of endorsement, sponsorship or encouragement for consumption and are meant for educational purposes only. In the first drop today, we're going to touch on the probably the biggest news of the week. Um, BlackRock launched a new institutional fund codenamed BUILD or B-Y-D-L and it's a money market fund aiming at maintaining a stable $1 value for each share of the fund. And it's the BlackRock USD Institutional Digital Liquidity Fund. And they're going to do that in partnership with uh, Securitize, which will act as their transfer agent, tokenization platform, and placement agent. And they also confirmed that they're investing um, a bringing a strategic investment to Securitized. Uh, so according to Robert Michnik, who's the BlackRock head of digital assets, and here I quote, we're focused on developing solutions in the digital asset space that help solve real problems for our clients, and we're excited to work with Securitize. Tokenization remains a key focus of BlackRock's digital asset strategy, end quote. According to the press release, uh, the tokens will be um, made available to accredited investors as part of Rules 506C um, in the U.S. The transfers can only take place between those pre-approved investors uh, in 24-7. So they're actually going to use cryptos, digital, uh, around-the-clock trading capability to allow for that. Uh, part of the structure is also with BNY Mellon, who's going to be the custodian of the underlying assets, the fund administrator, and will provide interoperability between digital and traditional markets, which tends to indicate that this is not a fund aimed at crypto natives, but is a crypto fund aimed at traditional investors that will then be able to trade between the stable shares of that fund and other traditional financial instruments. According to the press release, they didn't um, inform which types of assets we're gonna make or, or we're gonna make the, um, the the underlying assets. Uh, Ledger Insights reports that the assets will include cash, U.S. Treasuries, and repo agreements. Uh, and according to the press release, this will allow investors to to earn yield while holding the token on the blockchain. Uh, so it will work somewhat like a stable coin with a yield for the users, which usually uh, not exactly uh, what traditional crypto stable coins uh, usually do. Um, but it's interesting to see that uh, such a large financial player from the traditional market is bringing something in that direction uh, to the marketplace. According to the note, uh, the uh, securitized play uh, is because they have experience um, as operating as a tokenization platform and also as a trace transfer uh, agent uh, and they have done so with Hamilton Lane, KKR uh, and we're seeing a lot of other funds operating in the same space such as uh, Franklin Templeton so it's not something uh, that is a uh, that is a uh, uh, something we're going to see. The fund is going to be uh, based in the uh, BVI, the British Virgin Islands, and um, will, as I said, it's going to be available to accredited investors. In my opinion, this is the reason why this is one of the biggest uh, news of the week is because one, BlackRock is probably the largest uh, uh, fund management uh, firm in the world. Second uh, is they are actually entering the space by purchasing a stake uh, on Securitize, which has been one of the most popular names in tokenization of real world assets or mostly financial assets uh, in the last, uh, say, 12 months. 
Um, and this is a trend we've been reporting on for the last year or so, if not more. So RWAs uh, seem to be here to stay. The fact that this large of a, of a fund is uh, entering head on is important. They're using Ethereum layer one, which is also something that is interesting in terms of choice, uh, in terms of technical choice. Um, but definitely is a trend. And I hope that this is not just restricted to accredited investors. One of the biggest values of bringing things on chain is the ability to fractionalize ownership in ways that create more opportunities for more people. And this is what I hope as regulations become clearer in most of the largest markets, we'll see that come to fruition in terms of being more equitable in terms of access to all of these new um, financial innovations. While we are on the topic of stable assets, stable coins, uh, second drop today, we're going to talk about a new stable coin solution targeting cross-border payments for corporates by Zodia Markets. Zodia Markets is a company in the SC Ventures portfolio. SC Ventures is a the investment innovation investment arm f- uh, of Standard Charter Bank. And this was announced uh, last week uh, and, and also mentioned by uh, Alex Manson uh, that spoke to Ledger uh, Insights about this. Um, according to Alex, uh, Zodia is collaborating with Fireblocks to address correspondent banking challenges. Correspondent banking is a massive business model for the largest banks in the world. Standard Charter is one of those. It's a global systemically important bank. And it has international activities that is, by and large, a big chunk of the bank's business. Um, according to um, Nick Philpot, co-founder of Zodia Markets, and I quote, cross-border payments between many jurisdictions suffer from slow transaction speeds, limited availability during business hours, high costs, and a lack of transparency. Stable coins enable value transfer using the internet, Granting corporate entities a competitive edge the internet provides to other industries today. Ultimately, this collaboration places control of cross-border payments squarely in the hands of corporate treasurers and CFOs, end quote. Interesting note by Nick Philpott mentioning the internet. Um, and I feel that if we start treating the Web3 blockchain infrastructure as just part of the internet, I think we can communicate much better to non-crypto natives. So kudos to Phil for addressing such a, a <laughs> elephant in the room by just saying, yes, this is cross-border payments over the internet and we're going to address this with the internet and because everybody understands the internet. So uh, kudos to Phil for, for tackling that. Um, according to Richard Astle, uh, the VP business lead uh, net of Fireblocks Network, He says, and I quote, the expansion to non-USD on raw ramps is also on the rise, which makes this collaboration with Zodia Markets not just unique in its value proposition, but also marks the beginning of bringing effects on chain, end quote. We've gone through this in the show a few times. Um, FX is such a messy market, very centralized, a lot of take rates, as Phil mentioned, super uh, ready to be disrupted. And I feel that the, the, the power of blockchains for being natively digital cross-border, um, 24-7, programmatic, permissionless, is something that these markets will, can all count on and can all lean on to become more and more effective. So the fact that such a big player like Stanchart is actively investing in things that might come and disrupt their own current business model is really interesting. And hopefully this is something that it starts a pattern in the industry because everyone, both individuals and companies that need to send money abroad, will benefit from having that. The banks are going to have a much better service. They can charge better fees they also can operate in a better margin so some of that value can be transferred to both companies and individuals so everybody gets to do what they need to do at 
you know, price point, hopefully, and that's only because they're using, as Phil said, um, as Nick said, the internet. <laughs> so let's use the internet for cross-border payments. Also, stable coins, right? We're looking into stable coins as something that is relatable to the real world because they they are a unit of account, right? They are a means of exchange. Some of them are actual stores of value, which make them very interesting, very similar to actual fiat money, which then makes using the internet for payments a much more obvious choice. So yes, this is one of the trends. The only downside to this is that it might bite uh, Standard Charter, it might cannibalize a little bit of their businesses, but uh, according, again, to the um, to, to Alex Mason, if it cannibalizes an existing business, so be it, because if we don't do it, someone else will, end quote. In today's third drop, we're going to cover, again, loyalty, Web3 loyalty. Last week, we spoke about the uh, the Odyssey program for uh, from Starbucks that discontinued uh, that and what are the repercussions and consequences. If you didn't listen to that, I recommend you go back one episode and take a look. Um, we have a an interesting take of what it means for the overall Web3 adoption. But today we're going to talk about Alipay. Alipay Plus is the international arm of China's uh, Alipay, the largest payment uh, platform. And they're now running a proof of concept, a POC, using Avalanche. Avalanche is a layer one blockchain. And the goal of that uh, POC is to, uh, first, uh, in its first stage, is to allow users to play a branded mini game and then earn vouchers, which are NFTs. Uh, so they have discount on milk teas in Southeast Asia stores. The second stage of that program will be made available to other merchants and other areas uh, of the business and will reach into the overall uh, client base of Alipay Plus in Southeast Asia, which accounts for more than 100 million people. That is a lot of users. The trial part uh, will use the D store, which is Alipay Plus's uh, omni-channel solution for um, for food and beverage, and it allows the brands to uh, interact with clients in store and online, and adds to payment processing, which they do on a traditional rail, um, promotions and um, CRM relationship with the client base, and this is where they batting that the Avalanche project will add value to them and to users. Um, according to the according to the note, big brands like Burger King and Nando's are the clients of the D Store solution, which means that big brands will be able to access the Web3 voucher uh, when that gets uh, rolled out in stage two. Uh, according to the note again, uh, Avalanche uh, works for enterprises because they have the ability to create subnets, which are akin to layer twos, um, blockchains of layer two. Um, they are also uh, compatible to Ethereum, but they have additional uh, privacy features, which is always of interest to enterprises. And they have a solution for uh, abstracting the needs to pay for transaction fees, which in crypto we call gas fees or gas payments. So by using subnets, they abstract the need for the user to need to pay for transactional fees, which in the loyalty space makes a lot of sense. They have a number of clients in the space, and the goal is that uh, one brand offering a voucher could also lead to other brands offering different experiences based on the same voucher, which we discussed here last week as well, which is what some in the industry call a vampire attack, right? And vampire attack might sound weird, might sound like something that you don't want, but vampire attack only happens because using public chains, the data is available, you can know who owns each asset, and by only who know who owns each asset as a brand, you can actually activate specific campaigns for specific wallets or specific addresses. 
even if it's an airdrop of your own token that will then prompt them to come and check on your business or you can actually offer the same benefit or new benefit better said new benefit with the same voucher that they've received from another brand which ultimately leads to what we call the permissionless crm and hopefully a fully possible customer centricity that's not only centralized in one company but it's customer centricity in the level of the industry which is where we hope blockchains will come and make their mark is transforming horizontally how whole industries operate and crm is as you know big of a place to start uh, as any other and yeah loyalty makes sense because loyalty uh, as we use it we're kind of used to abstract things into points points can be made you know in form of the token the token can be made in form of an nft then the person interacting with that can already learn how to use self-custody and when they please realize they are ready and onboarded in crypto so interesting to see let's see how much more we're gonna see this in next bull run because it's not starbucks you know giving up on the program doesn't mean that loyalty in web3 is done On a week back full of news, here is more. CoinLedger will partner with MetaMask to simplify tax reporting for crypto. Polymash announced their private permissioned implementation to attract enterprises that wants to embark on tokenization of assets. Bitsu announced their solution, uh, Bitsu Business, was chosen by Chile's Andean Wide for their cross-border payments. The European Union is going to ban anonymous crypto transactions that use self-custodial wallets, putting a lot of strain in crypto-native companies. Catch us online. We're on Instagram at Blockdrops Podcast, on Twitter at Blockdrops Pod or Xerox Mauricio. We're on Lens at blockdrops.lens. We have a newsletter on LinkedIn. Write to us at blockdropspodcast at gmail.com. And you can listen to the Blockdrops podcast at Spotify, Icolab, Febraboon Tech, and all of the other major streaming platforms. Yay! Shout outs today to the people who share the links you will find in the episode notes. Andrea Frosinini, Dina White, David Cameron, Simon Taylor, Laurie Kehoe, Anthony Day, José Luis González Birlain, Dave Burrows, and Lex Sokolin. Don't forget to leave your ratings on your favorite player. This is all for today. Stay rare, stay weird. LFG.